We have come to the end of Kant, and so we've also come to the end of our introduction to deontology. So this video is summing up uh, Kant and also deontology as an approach to ethics. We have three topics. We've kind of covered all three already, but uh, we'll review them because they're important review topics for the end. Starting with the first. So, what did we read? We read Kant's Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. And this turns out to be important for a few reasons. So look at the title, Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. So this book, as Kant conceives of it, is a groundwork for something else. And if you go back and you read the preface and the first section, you'll notice Kant is very clear about this being a groundwork. And if you think back to where we left off at the end of the third section, which is Kant saying, well, I can't sort of prove any of this beyond a reasonable doubt. I can just show that we need to assume it. And if we need to assume it, here is the form that it takes. So that might sound like kind of a silly place to leave morality. You've told us that we can't prove it, we can merely assume the form that it will take. Uh, how, <laughs> I wanted more. But the groundwork is sort of in large part a meta-ethical project. So if you think back to the division of ethics into meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics that we talked about in I think the very first lecture, Meta-ethics is sort of theoretical questions about ethics, and the fact that this book is a groundwork for the metaphysics of morals means that a lot of it is taken up with these sort of meta-ethical topics about um, what is ethics ultimately grounded on, or what is the fundamental source of ethics, or things like that. And so this topic, for Kant, is always going to end up in a slightly unsatisfying place, because Kant thinks all knowledge, not just all ethical knowledge, but all knowledge is ultimately grounded on these kind of presuppositions that we have to make about the noumenal realm. Uh, this is not supposed to be like a skeptical worry for him. He has lots to say kind of metaphysically about why this is okay and it's not a big deal. The only relevance this has to us is just to realize, look, the project here is not to describe the entirety of morality. It's to sort of give morality a sort of a, like a metaphysical basis and to so that we can develop from there. He does more than just that. So the reason we read this book, even though it's got all this meta ethics, is because he also kind of gives us the fundamental principle of normative ethics of his deontological system, which is the categorical imperative. And he says all this other interesting stuff too. But ultimately the book is a groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. He wrote a book called The Metaphysics of Morals. We're not going to read that, but you can go read that and get lots more detail on his ethical system. He also wrote The Critique of Practical Reason, even more ethical stuff in there. He's got even more ethical writings there. So we don't want to sort of mistake ourselves into thinking we've read sort of everything Kant has to say about ethics. We've read most of what Aristotle has to say. So the politics is kind of about ethics for him, and he has another book called The Eudemian Ethics. But we got like the main Aristotelian ethics. For Kant, we just got sort of the groundwork, the basics, and then it's up to us and to Kant to sort of develop from there. So that's the initial point to begin with, which is we read the groundwork, and this is not sort of everything. It's the sort of basis of everything. And in the categorical imperative, you're supposed to be able to derive all the rest of morality. But it's not like he thinks he's finished. There is still a lot more to say. So that's just, don't sort of think that this kind of thin theory we've got, which is just the categorical imperative, and then basically four examples that he repeats a couple times. For him, that's, it's like the fundamental principle of morality. In principle, you can develop everything from there. But he realizes that, you know, to be complete, we'd need to say much more. So that's the first point. We've only read the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, and that explains why there's so much meta-ethics, and also why it's kind of thin. 
The second point is to cover three very common mistakes or misunderstandings people have about Kant. We've seen the first and the third explicitly already. I've talked about them in lecture. I don't think I called out the second one explicitly, but we have seen it reading Kant. He's very clear about this. But still, it's very easy to make these mistakes. And also, these mistakes relate to his morality in important ways. So it's helpful just to talk about them again. So the first mistake is misunderstanding Kant's uh, relationship to emotion and morality. And I think this used to be reason, emotion, and no, what, I don't know. So emotion and morality, what do they have to do with each other? The impression you can sort of get from Kant is nothing. He says only actions done from the motive of duty have moral worth. Actions done in conformity with duty, but not from the motive of duty, have no moral worth. And so you might think, oh, if I act, if I do the right thing from some sort of emotion, but not from duty, Kant says, I don't have any moral worth. And so Kant is sort of prioritizing reason over emotion, and he hates emotion, or he thinks emotion is just not important to morality, or a good person is going to be emotionless, feeling emotion is bad, emotions get in the way. No, no, no. So remember, we read the groundwork for the metaphysics, and he thinks the groundwork of morality can't be based on emotion. You can't build a moral system out of emotion or desire or feeling or sentiment or inclination, any of these sorts of things. That can't be the fundamental basis of your moral system. The fundamental basis of your moral system has to be based on reason. Reason and goodwill, with goodwill, will being rationality, rationality being reason, so it's all the same. Reason has to be the fundamental basis of morality. But that doesn't mean emotion is uh, useless or anything like this. Kant realizes that you'll want to have the right sorts of emotions to help you act morally. Now, the emotion doesn't add to the moral worth of your action. So merely having the right emotion doesn't make you a better person. Acting on the right emotion doesn't make you a better person. You have to act because it's your duty. But you can act because it's your duty and because you feel like it. They're not incompatible. You can do both at the same time. In fact, Kant thinks it's very difficult or effectively impossible to really know why you do anything. You might tell yourself you're acting from duty, but really you're doing it because you want to. So he thinks it's very hard to search inside yourself and find out whether emotion is making you act or duty is making you act or both. He says, certainly, there's no hope of ever figuring out for other people whether emotion is making them act, or duty is making them act, or both. So he doesn't want you to go out and start pointing at people who seem very emotional and saying, oh, you're not morally good, you're acting on emotion, you're not acting on duty. No, 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 don't do that for other people, and don't even do it for yourself. What he's saying is just, look, fundamentally what matters is doing your duty because it's your duty. Can we often achieve that? Is emotion often mixed in? You know, that's those are all psychological questions. There might be good emotions to have. He says in the book, in the groundwork, I think in section two, that we have an indirect duty to promote our happiness because that makes it easier for us to act morally. We have a duty to promote other people's happiness. He thinks that's a duty. So emotion plays lots of roles in his morality. So he's not saying we all need to be emotionless, we can never have emotions, it's morally bad to have emotions. He's just saying goodness doesn't depend on having the right emotions. Goodness sort of fundamentally depends on doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And this is important for lots of reasons you can imagine, but one is that uh, we've seen already one difference Kant has with Aristotle. For Aristotle, if you do the right thing, but sort of reluctantly, you feel bad about it, that's not virtue, that's continence. It's good you're doing the right thing, but it's bad that you don't feel happy about it. For Kant, as long as you do the right thing for the right reasons, that's all it takes to have sort of moral goodness. So you might think Kant is less um, uh, demanding than Aristotle. Aristotle says you have to do the right thing for the right reasons, and you have to feel good about it if you want to be virtuous. Kant says, no, I don't care if you enjoy being moral. You can be perfectly moral 
even if you're a jerk, as long as you do what you need to do, even if you feel curmudgeonly and you don't like helping people, as long as you help them, that's all it takes. Aristotle would say you're a worse person. Kant would say, no, you're perfectly fine. So the second mistake people often make when they read Kant is that if you think about in section two, when he says you must always treat people as an end in themselves, never merely as a means, the word merely is very, very, very important. Kant does not say it's wrong to treat people as a means. We treat people as a means all the time, every day. It's impossible not to. You are treating me as a means to learn philosophy by listening to me lecture. You treat, uh, like anybody doing a job for you is being used as a means. So if somebody serves you lunch in the uh, mess, or if somebody drives you somewhere, you're treating them as a means to something else. They're a means to getting food or a means to transporting you. Totally okay. What's bad is treating somebody merely as a means, not as an end in themselves at the same time. So when you treat me as a means for getting information, for learning about philosophy, you also have to simultaneously treat me as an end in myself. What does it take to treat somebody as an end in themselves? Well, we can go back to the second section and see what Kant says. It's kind of hard to tell, like he gives us a few examples, but not a lot. We do know that this is just supposed to be a version of the categorical imperative. So basically just as long as you're acting morally, you're treating people as an end in themselves. So what exactly being an end in itself is, like that's a big question. But the point here is just treating someone as a means perfectly fine. It's treating somebody only as a means or merely as a means and not also as an end in themselves. That's, that's what's bad. The third common mistake people make is forgetting what is the sort of object of moral evaluation. The categorical imperative says act only on maxims that you can will uh, as universal or, you know, uh, act only such that you can will that your maxim become a universal law of nature or something like that, or as you're a legislator in the kingdom of ends. Notice what we're testing with the categorical imperative is a maxim. Act only on a maxim that you can will is universal. So what we're testing is your maxim, or in other words, your intention or your will. The thing you're trying to do, the reason that you're acting, the thing sort of in your head getting you to move, the motivating uh, part of your will, the representation of the law in your head. So it's the maxim for Kant that is moral or immoral, that passes or fails the categorical imperative test. So what that means is that when we ask a moral question for Kant, we're asking, is this the right maxim? Is this the right reason for acting? Is this the right intention? Is this the right will to have? We are not asking, is this the right action? Is this the right outcome? Is this the right consequence? So people sometimes, like it's easy to make this mistake. And in fact, as I pointed out in one of my videos earlier, I, when I was loosely talking, I even made this mistake, just saying like, oh, Kant says you shouldn't lie or something, or Kant says you shouldn't kill yourself. No, he doesn't, he actually doesn't care what actions you do. He doesn't care if you lie or if you kill yourself. He cares if you, have a maxim that causes you to lie, or a maxim that causes you to kill yourself. There are impermissible maxims, maxims that it's not okay to have, or intentions, in other words, that it's not okay to have. So actions are not bad or wrong or forbidden or anything. Intentions are bad or wrong or forbidden or good, or some intentions you're supposed to have and things like this. So strictly speaking, Kant doesn't care about outcomes or actions. Uh, he has that part in the first section where he says, look, the goodwill is good on its own. Uh, it would even shine forth like a jewel, even if uh, you weren't able to carry out your goodwill. So you could have the right maxims or the right will or the right intentions in your head, but you just aren't able to act on them. Again, like you're very sick or you're stuck or something, or you just get unlucky. That's totally okay. It's not the action that matters. It's not the outcome. It's the intention. 
Now, of course, your intention or your maxim is often linked to the action or the outcome. In normal cases, one causes the other. Your intention causes the, ax the action. The maxim leads to an outcome. But that's, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes things go wrong. So here Kant diverges from Aristotle, who says quite a few actions matter because virtue is a matter of, in part, phronesis, uh, practical wisdom. You have to be able to know how to do the right thing. And if you can't actually do the right thing, then you don't really know how to do it. Just like if you can't ride a bike, then you don't know how to ride a bike. So the action, riding the bike or doing the virtuous thing, is part of virtue for Aristotle. And in fact, virtue itself is an action for Aristotle. It's an activity. You can't be virtuous just sitting there or at a moment. Virtue happens over time. So Kant disagrees with Aristotle. He's also going to disagree with our next author, Mill, who actually says the outcome is the only thing that matters. Like absolutely nothing except consequences matter for Mill. So that's an interesting view that Kant has. And it's very, very easy to just slip into saying the wrong thing, as if Kant cares about actions or results. He, do he doesn't. He doesn't care about actions. He doesn't care about results. He cares about intentions or maxims or your will. Finally, the third point. So Kant is our example of a deontologist, a deontological moral theory. If you recall from how I explained deontology in the first Kant lecture, I said, they're moral theories that are sort of about the duties that we have, or they're moral theories that say sort of people have rights or things have rights that you have to respect. So let's think about Kant. What are the duties that Kant says we have? Well, ultimately there's like one duty, which is act only on maxims that you can will uh, become universal laws of nature or uh, like, <laughs> he's got like three ways of saying the same thing. Or your duty is always treat people as an end in themselves, never, never merely as a means, or uh, always act such that you imagine yourself as a legislator in the kingdom of ends. So those are that's your duty. You just have one duty described three ways, or maybe it's three duties, I don't know. That's your duty for Kant. But he thinks from this we can sort of derive other duties. So like I said earlier in this video, he thinks we have a duty, an indirect duty to promote our own happiness. He thinks we have duties to promote the happiness of others. He thinks we have duties not to kill ourselves for the sake of self-love. He thinks we have duties not to lie to people for the sake of uh, getting money from them that you don't intend to pay back. Basically, there are sort of more specific duties we can derive from the one like central categorical imperative duty. So that's Kant's picture. He's got all these duties. Um, different deontologists have different sorts of duties. So Kant, again, strictly speaking, has one, or maybe they all fall out like he has a bunch, which all come from one. Other deontologists have like, I don't know, 10 duties or something. So W.D. Ross, for instance, is another famous deontologist. He has, it might be 10, I don't know. He, ha he has like a list of what he calls prima facie duties or duties sort of, uh, well, they, properly speaking, they should be pro tanto duties, which are duties that, you know, these are all things that you should do, but you can't like always do all of them. So they're just pro tanto. They're just sort of, if you can do them, do them. When they conflict, you know, pick the more important one or something. But there are things like be kind to others and uh, don't lie and, uh, I don't know, all the, all the general moral stuff. And so the sorts of duties that deontologists have often sort of look like, you know, the typical moral rules. But you could have a deontology which is like different sorts of duties. So libertarian philosophers have a duty-based deontology, which is basically just um, like hands-off duties. So don't interfere with others. Don't harm others. There are no positive duties for them. So you never have to help somebody. If you want to, you can, but it's never your duty to help anybody. It's just your duty not to interfere with other people, not to harm other people, not to take their stuff. So that's a sort of deontological moral theory. So depending on the kind of duties you have, you can have very different deontological moral theories. What about from the perspective of rights? So for Kant, what sort of rights do we have or what sort of rights are there? Well, if you think about the second formulation of the categorical imperative, always treat people as an end in themselves, never merely as a means. I have a right to be treated as an end in itself. And all rational creatures have this right. 
and from this right flows everything else. So the thought is there's sort of one central right to be treated as an end in themselves, and this gets us all sorts of moral conclusions. It gets us duties, basically. So that's Kant's like rights-based approach. The libertarian approach is, again, similar. We all have negative rights, basically rights that other people don't harm us. So I have a right that you don't kill me. I have a right against you stealing from me and stuff. But we don't have any positive rights, which are rights to assistance. So I don't have a right that you help me out if I'm in distress for the libertarian. For Kant, I do have a right that you help me out because, look, I'm an end in, my, in, in itself. And I mean, he doesn't explain this very clearly in the book, but like, you know, if you're an end in your, uh, yourself, you have, well, no, he does explain it clearly. You have a dignity beyond any sort of price. And so humans are worth more than, you know, any money or any property or anything. So we all have duties to sort of help other people, even at the cost of, you know, money or property, because that stuff just doesn't even match up to the worth of an end in itself, of a human being, of a rational creature. So that's a sort of, again, a reiteration of what deontological moral theories are like. Kant is a great example of them, but there are other sorts of kinds. And uh, great, okay, I didn't have an end for this video. <laughs>